Republicans in Congress keep blocking or voting down almost every serious idea to strengthen the middle class. And as long as they insist on doing it, I'm going to keep taking actions on my own. On my own. On my own. On my own. Science doesn't support that. So if the court rules in Hobby Lobby's favor, isn't it saying that religion can make those decisions over science? The court applied the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and said these closely held companies uh, have those rights, those rights to religious freedom under the act. Well, the Chief Justice wrote nothing today, but on this one, Hobby Lobby, his role is very significant. No one should be saying that this is a narrow decision. For him to join the majority today, striking down the contraceptive mandate for closely held corporations, which by the way also means striking it down for sole proprietorships and nonprofits as well, is very, very telling. I'm going to keep taking actions on my own. Freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. An informed patriot is what we want. Welcome to Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Muscular Christianity. Where we relentlessly explore the intersection of truth and politics. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Now, here's your host, Brian Fisher. Hi, and welcome to this Monday edition of Focal Point on AFR Talk, a brand new week of broadcasting here on the American Family Radio Talk Network. I am Brian Fisher, congenial, amiable, and convivial, as always. Glad to welcome you aboard the USS Focal Point as we continue to patrol the choppy waters of America's public life, looking relentlessly for the intersection of truth and politics. Now, we're going to talk about this Hobby Lobby decision, major, major win. For religious liberty. And the reason you know that, the only thing you need to know about this ruling to believe that this was a great victory for religious liberty, for the Constitution, is that Sotomayor, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Stephen Breyer all opposed this ruling. They were all in the minority. Any ruling that has Ginsburg against it, Sotomayor against it, Kagan against it, Breyer, you know as a matter of absolute fact, it is a fantastic ruling. So this is a good ruling. It is a win for religious liberty. We're going to talk about that. Talk about updates in the McDaniel-Cochran race. McDaniel Camp now saying they are actually making some significant progress in establishing the likelihood that there are enough fraudulent votes in this election to actually call for a brand new runoff election to compel a judge or convince a judge to do that. So we're going to talk about that as the program uh, develops. Now, before we jump into all of that, I want to talk a little bit about the issue of marriage and divorce from 1 Corinthians 7, and then we'll pray for marriages in the United States family. Marriage is obviously in very desperate shape right now in America, and this is the cornerstone of any healthy civilization. That's why we have to care about marriage policy. We have to care about the definition of marriage because this is where sexual expression is legitimately enjoyed, and this is where God has designed children to be born and to be raised, to be nurtured to maturity as by a mom and a dad that are married to each other. And if that basic structure breaks down, it means chaos and dissolution and disruption for your entire civilization. Now, it's interesting that when you look at the writing of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, I believe there's good evidence to believe that Paul himself was a divorced man not by his own will, but because his wife, who was an unbeliever, never came to faith in Christ, she left him. I believe that's the implication of 1 Corinthians 7. Now, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 7, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each one has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So he says the same thing that Jesus said in Matthew 19, the gift of being able to be Celibate, to be single and celibate and happy is a gift from God. Not everybody's got it. So Paul says this. Here's his counsel in verse 8 to the unmarried and the widows. Now the word for unmarried here is the word for marriage, gamos. We get monogamy from that. Gamos, the word for marriage. Monogamy meaning married only to one woman. Uh, gamos is the word for marriage and it is prefixed with a negative. And it could be translated unmarried, as it is in the ESV in a lot of translations. 
But it also, I believe, the best way to translate this in the context is those who have been demarried. They were married, and now they have been demarried. They are single because they have been divorced. So I think the best way to translate this, as Paul says, to the demarried and to the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain as they are, to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. Now what the demarried, that is what the divorced and widows have in common, is they've enjoyed sexual expression. They have known the experience of sexual intimacy. And with that experience in the background, perhaps it's very, very difficult for them to adjust to life without that. Paul says, unless you've got a gift, you know, I would like you to stay as I am. I was once married. I once knew the joys of sexual intimacy and marriage. I think the implication, his wife left him because of his belief. She couldn't take it, so she peeled out. And Paul says, look, I would like you to be content and single as I am, but if you're not able to do it, then go ahead and get married. Again, here's one of the first places where I believe Paul explicitly authorizes Christians who have been divorced to remarry. Now, it doesn't mean under every circumstance. You have to look at the circumstances of uh, the divorce. But there are Christians who are have been divorced, and there wasn't anything they could do to stop it. It wasn't their will. It wasn't their decision. They didn't agree with it. They resisted it. They fought it. They didn't want it. But there wasn't anything they could do to stop it. So they are divorced not because of their own will or decisions they've made, but decisions that were forced upon them. Now they find themselves single again, having been married, knowing the joys of intimacy and companionship. And Paul says, look, if that's the circumstances of your divorce, then it is permissible for you to remarry as long as you remarry in the Lord. So Paul says this to those who are married. Again, he's writing to believers who are married to each other. To the married, I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate or literally divorce her husband. But if she does, she should remain divorced or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. I think Paul is writing here about circumstances. He, he was asked this question by the Corinthian church, and they were dealing with a situation where a woman, a Christian woman, had divorced her Christian husband. They want to know what to do. It was pending, so Paul says, look, if it's happened, if she's gone through with this divorce, then her responsibility is either to remain divorced or seek reconciliation uh, with her husband. Remember, Jesus says if you divorce a spouse in order to marry somebody else, you break up a marriage in order to marry somebody else that's already married to someone else, that's not a legitimate marriage in God's eyes. That is an adulterous relationship, and that's apparently what was going on in 1 Corinthians 7. Then he says to the rest, that is to believers who are married to unbelievers, he says this, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Because that would come up. Well, I'm unequally yoked now. We were both unbelievers when I came to faith in Christ, when we got married, we were both unbelievers. Now, one of us is a believer, one of the, the other one is not. What do we do? It's a good question. Paul says you remain married as long as your unbelieving partner is willing to remain married to you. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. They've been dedicated uh, to the Lord. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not under bondage. God has called you to peace. Wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? So the believing partner wants to remain married in order to be the agent through which God works to bring them to faith in Christ. And Paul says, look, maybe God intends somebody else for somebody else to do that. Well, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray this day that unbelieving spouses in our land will consent to remain married to their believing spouses. We pray that you will check believing spouses from initiating divorce so that their marriages and their children may be made holy through them and set apart for you. Grant believers whose unbelieving spouses seek divorce great wisdom and strength. May they remember that you have called us to peace in such circumstance and may they know when to, to let go. Allow them to trust you to bring salvation to their husbands or wives through others. 
Amen. Coming soon to afastore.net, it's the highly anticipated DVD release of God's Not Dead, the movie. God is dead. College freshman Josh Wheaton finds his faith challenged and has to choose between his faith and his future. I can't do what you want, I'm a Christian. When your faith is tested, would you fight for what you believe? God's Not Dead, he's surely God's alive. Not Dead, the movie, comes out on DVD in August. Pre-order your copy today at afastore.net. Tim Wildman, president of the American Family Association, on the film Alone Yet Not Alone. I was really impressed. I've seen the film twice, and this is a movie you can take your whole family to see. Alone Yet Not Alone is the true story of a pioneer Christian family of unshakable faith. No matter how hard the trial, God will never leave you or forsake you. Now showing. Tickets can be reserved at aloneyetnotalone.com. James and I were sitting at this table when I told him he was going to be a father, and Dave asked our permission to marry Kate right here. This table has seen nearly every holiday meal in our lives. The finish is well-worn, but the structure is sound. Thanks be to God, we're planning to leave more than this old table to our children. We're leaving a legacy of heritage, faith, and sweet memories. There have been Christian organizations right beside us all the way, laboring to strengthen families and maintain the